Hello, everyone. We did a uh, one of the uh, sort of our free review sessions, and I kind of um, I kind of hinted that uh, it was kind of time for me to st you know shut up and actually um, you know make good on a promise that I've been making for a while, which is to kind of expose people to this the way that I work. And um, that's when Scott was like, well, why don't you do like a demo instead of like a, a review session? I'm like, that's a really good idea. And now it kind of just gave me an opportunity to just do this thing that I've been always talking about. Um, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Now it's very unprepared. It's gonna be very raw. I don't have like a presentation for you. Um, I do plan on doing a proper video eventually and, and making a learning path out of this. So what you're kind of going to get tonight is a really um, pretty much a uh, an, uh, <laughs> an unfiltered raw demonstration of what this this whole concept is uh but it won't be it certainly won't be the most perfect of demonstrations because i just like i said i'm just kind of winging it tonight and which is easy for me because i teach this all the time it's actually how i animate so it's not that big of a deal but before we get into any of that we need to actually kind of talk a little bit about what this philosophy is where it came from why 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 i created it um, let's talk a little bit about that first, um, and then we'll kind of, um, you, you know, transition into applying it in some way. And there's going to be a few things I'm going to want to do um, to, to really show this off what I'm going to actually even do. And I don't even know if I'll even get to actually doing any actual demonstrations tonight because it's it'll be like an hour. And then once an hour is up, then we're going to stop and I will continue this probably next week. And we'll just kind of keep going until I get through the whole thing. And then um, hopefully it will take about two or three streams to completely uh, to complete the circle. Um, but, um, what I'm going to do is I'm even going to incorporate a little bit of motion builder into this because, uh, one of the, my favorite things to do is to show this. I can very quickly demonstrate this using motion builder because with motion builder, I'll be working with mocap data and mocap data, of course, is a lot faster to get up and running than keyframe from scratch. Don't worry. I'm not going to short change anybody. We will get to the key, the keyframing bit, but, um, I think that, uh, the, uh, the motion capture is going to make it easier for me to demonstrate some of these concepts first so that you can see what I'm talking about. And then once we really kind of get it, then we'll be like, okay, now what would that look like if we wanted to start from, from, from scratch, all right? But in the end, what I want us all to walk away from is what is an anime of an action and how can it help me as an animator, basically. I think that um, the, um, the, 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 uh, the goal for me is that I could put, a, I could give everybody a yet another tool in their toolbox. Um, I find that having taught it for as many years as I have, I found that one of the most common issues is, uh, is, is people's not understanding, um, you know, like they, they get a lot of these concepts. I saw, I've seen so many people teach this stuff, like this idea of like, oh, okay, keyframing, cool, the basics. And I mean, there's the principles, which is great. Um, but even with the principles, there's not really any obvious guide as to what to use as your poses. Everyone says, oh, you know, keyframes, all about them. It's, you know, people have even different names for it. Like there's, you know, people just call some of them just actual keyframes um, as opposed to keys. Some people call them like your extremes. There's all these different terminologies, but all the terminologies, do is just give a name to something that's still really misunderstood. So what this is, this whole concept that I'm about to explain to you is a way for you to very reliably understand what you actually need to have in a, as a pose, as a series of poses in order to describe an action. It's for me, it's very formulaic. It's very obvious what I need. And every single time I go and grab those poses, it, it takes a lot of stress out of the whole animation process because when I'm blocking something out, it's literally just a matter of, of like, yeah, give me some reference and I can break it down in a heartbeat and then I can be up and running within moments. It's unbelievably, unbelievably satisfying to have something that reduces my stress load like that. Because when I used to animate, I did it all instinctively. I had all kinds of weird ways of doing it. I came from 2D and I was sort of very, very much, very much self-taught as 3D because I went to a school, but the, the school didn't have anybody with a great deal of experience with character animation. It was very much a generalist sort of program with a bunch of like generalists, not keyframe people. Like they weren't, they, they, we just didn't have a lot of character animators um, as teachers. Ironically, I ended up teaching relatively soon after leaving that school because I ended up now, you know, having, you know, bu building up some skills um, in, you know, in that space in 3D. Um, uh, but I, but I, but it was, I was right from the very beginning learning how to use 
this new pencil that was the software to do what I already understood how to do. But it wasn't perfect. You know, the, I had a really awkward way of animating. It was not great. Um, I just, it was kind of all over the place. I often just animated just the core. Some people still do this. It's like a way that people animate. Like they animate just the hips first. They try to get that all blocked out. But I mean, um, it, it, it never really gave me consistent results. And I was always stressed because I was like, I just didn't have an obvious approach. So I always almost feel like I was reinventing the wheel every friggin' single time. I mean, let me just talk directly to you. If you are an animator and you've been animating for a little while, do you not have a little bit of stress every single time it, 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 it's time to animate a shot where you're just like, oh my God. And you feel kind of almost like that sometimes when you actually get a good shot and it works, it's like, it's almost like it feels lucky and you don't know how to rep reproduce that luckiness. And so it's stressful because you don't know, is this going to be one of those days or one of those animations that are just going to be a train wreck? Or is it going to be one of the ones that you're like the planets align and you can actually, you know, do a pretty good job on it. That's how I felt all the time. So I know how you feel and it's not cool. Um, this whole thing I'm about to explain to you is something that I guarantee you will give you a lot more confidence going into this because it's a tried and tested formula that allows you to just stop worrying about whether it's going to work or not because you it will. It's just a matter of putting the time in and doing it. It's not a surefire way of suddenly being an amazing animator. Right? It's just like anything else. You still need to put the time in and there still needs to be a lot of other things understood, but at least, at least you can know with confidence do I have a good base? Do I have good poses to start with? Yes or no? Because if you do not have a good set of poses to start with, you are screwed from the beginning. It is like you are going to be polishing a turd. I promise you. A lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about the block. I mean, you, if you listen to David, I'm just like him, David, David Bear. He, he, like, this is back when he used to animate. He's like, he's coming up on like 10 years that he's, he has, he's even animated um, anything because he's just, he's been directing now for so long and he just doesn't have a lot of time to actually animate. But from what he remembers from the good old days is uh, spending most of his time with the block. I'm exactly the same way. It's like, I really take a very serious approach with the block um, to make sure that, um, that I have something that works. And it used to, like I said, it used to be, I used to waste a lot of time because I was trying things and I was retrying things. And now I'm just like, as long as I get some, have some good reference, I'm good to go. So, um, so basically to get into it, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this not just me talking. I'm going to be showing some things, but I don't have a, like a person presentation per se, but I'll be demonstrating in motion builder very, very soon. Um, let's just talk really quickly about um, what, what it is, why do I, like anatomy of an action, what is it? Why is this gonna be so helpful? Basically in a nutshell, the anatomy of an action is exactly what it sounds like. It is the bits and pieces composed of, you know, what, what, what an action is composed of. If you were to break down an action into little pieces, you know, ingredients or steps or part, body parts, these are the body parts we're talking about. So. Um, basically I'm making some generalizations with regards to, um, pretty much any action would require at least some, if not all of these parts. Okay. And I'm going to describe them right now. And then I'm going to show you, um, I'll show you with, um, a, a little, a little document that I've, that I've made in the past, a little breakdown of an action. And I'll, I'll show you like a video and, um, and then I'm going to go into, uh, I'll go into, um, Rhino House. Rhino House, I'm a, a firm believer in, um, especially when you're just starting out as an animator, because it gives you a really good uh, library of video references that uh, most importantly you have two two angles. Um, when you're learning, you are you'd be you'd be crazy to not do everything within your power to get two angles of your action in reference. I get, I have a hard enough time just getting people to use reference in general, but. Even then, that's really not enough. I think that you need to, people. It's it's amazing how many people are like, oh, I want to be better at animating. And it's like, okay, cool. Show me your reference. They're like, oh, I don't really use reference. It's like, well, isn't that the most obvious way to get better at animating? And we're like, what do you mean? I'm like, the, the reference is going to teach you everything you need to know. You just, as long as you know, you need to know where to look. But even then, could cut, if, you, if you looked at reference long enough, you start seeing the patterns yourself. And then you just start getting better at an action, at like animating an action. Because animation is really all about observation. 
It's all about understanding the movement and breaking it down and then trying to replicate it. And you need some way of doing that. You need a mechanism. Your brain needs a, a, like a, an approach to doing that. And that's what this anatomy and action should give you is looking at a you know reference and, and breaking it down like I'm saying. What I'm going to show you tonight, you'd be able to practice the crap out of what I'm showing you and you're just going to get better automatically because what it's what it's going to be, it's going to be a, a, a window, a set of glasses, a lens that you can put over your eyes to see an action and then you could practice breaking it down and creating these these blocks basically and um the more you do that the better you're going to get because it's not enough you know it's it's one thing to actually have the reference uh and one thing to have like a recipe of the reference but it you need to like this is another thing that i think the anatomy of action is going to do is it's going to help you see past this sort of weird fuzzy logic that you most people use when they're looking at a, um and like a reference and then animating it it's it it forces you to think in terms of movement and forces, right? Like it, 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 like it's like telling a story of an action. You know, every story needs like, um, you know, a premise, and every story needs some sort of conflict, and every story needs some sort of resolution. There's pieces of a story. There's anatomy of a story, and so we're doing the same thing with action. And in with with some, if you're missing some of these pieces, the story is not going to be very great. It's going to be pretty boring. Just like if you're missing some of these pieces, the uh, the action will fall short and it won't it won't sell properly. All right. So that's another thing. It, it kind of builds. It, it creates it creates a different perspective for animators. So that you know, a lot of animators think they're thinking like this, but then when I'm teaching them and I ask them questions like, "How do you know how a jump works?" And they're like, uh, I don't know, you know, you, you jump, you know, you jump up. And it's like, yeah, but why? What, what, why? What is it that's making you go up? You know, and people are kind of like, oh, my God, I've never even thought of that before. And if you're an animator and you haven't thought about that before and you find yourself trying to animate a jump, that's the problem. The problem is you don't understand how a jump works. You literally just don't know. And so you are kind of instinctively trying to figure it out because you've seen jumps before. But because you're instinctively trying to figure it out, then you don't have a mechanism that allows you to like actually understand how a jump works. How are you then going to go through that that block and ask yourself, are all the pieces there? You're just it's all you are. You, all you're working with is this sort of cloudy, blurry memory of what a, what, what a jump is in your mind. And that's no good. That's no good. Animators need to be thinking many, many layers deeper than that. They need to get inside the, the head of a jump and be like, oh, well, obviously a jump needs this and a jump needs that and a jump needs this. So when I one thing I would ask everybody before I get into this is I want you to understand that that's the key to unlocking this. Using this as a paint by number is never going to work. It gives you a frame of reference. It gave it gives you a, a template that you could apply to something and be like, oh, okay, where is this? Where is that? Oh, I don't see that in my reference. Why? Like, ask yourself if you can't find it. Be like, hmm. And you should be able to go. Oh, wait, no, it's there. It's just subtle. Or you'd be like, well, no, it's not there, and this is why. Ob obviously, it's not going to have that. You need to be able to have that kind of internal conversation when you're looking at a reference. But if you don't, if you're not thinking about it on that level and you're just like, you're just confused because it's just something that, you know, Brent said, do this, this, and this, it's never going to work the way that you're hoping. You need to absolutely, 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 it, it forces you to engage with the subject matter and think deep about it. Why are these things? Um, it's funny because when, it had, when we had Wayne Gilbert on, who was an instructor, like he was one of the, my first people, the first people in my life to teach me about animation. It was so uh, like, it was like the circle was complete. Having him on the stream during the 24 hour challenge um, was so awesome because he, he was saying things that I'm just like, Oh my God, like exactly. Now, and, and that that's that felt really good to me because, you know, he and I, he we both would have because we both come from 2D and we both would have had to figure things out in 3D. But it's nice to know that, like, we think very similarly on a bunch of things like this concept. He would say things that I'm like, yes, exactly that. And, um, you know, I think that that a lot of that is just because we've been doing this for a while and we have perspective on this now, but you also can be in the same position um, as, as, as we are by just simply making sure that you look at animation differently and think about it as what's necessary for actions to take place so that you know what's missing basically. So I've talked enough about this in circles. Let's get into the meat of it. Um, I will try to come back on this point on, on a lot because sometimes I'll teach this and people forget to like critically think about it. They forget to be like, why is it? Why does this make sense? Why does this? Why does this feel right? Um, once you start to kind of engage with that, it suddenly this is going to become very powerful to you. 
you need to get inside the head of why this is a useful thing to like a construct because only then is it activating the full part of your brain that can then really dig in on this. You can't just apply it sort of haphazardly to things and just expect it to work. It does require quite a decent amount of like cerebral activity to really like nail it. So let's, um, let's get into it, shall we? Um, I think of note here when you're working on, um, you know, when you're working on doing some simple exercises, a lot of people jump really, really too far ahead when they want to learn these things. They will, they're going to go and they're going to reach for gold and they're going to try to do something way too complicated. And, um, you know, that's not the right way to learn, in my opinion. I think you'd be smart to go and look for things that are more straightforward and, um, and not like crazy over the top. And, and one of those things I like to do is like look for simple actions, simple, complete actions, like just a jump or a sidestep. So, here is some reference. What's nice about this reference, in my opinion, is the fact that um, I have uh, two views. I have a side view and I have a front view. Whenever you're rec uh, recording reference, I would highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend that you get a front and a side. Like always try to get some sort of two like oblique angles, you know, 90 degrees from one another. Ideally, uh, one right along the axis that the, of, the, of the movement, if you can, sometimes it's not gonna be that simple, and one that's completely perpendicular to that movement, or that, 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 yeah, that, that, that actual movement, and so that you get a really good three-dimensional view of, of the action. Because I find when you're learning, um, you, there's gonna be things that are happening there that you, you're not anticipating, that you don't know. Um, and you don't wanna have to rely on like a Richard Williams book to tell you all the things that might be happening because there are so many actions and um, there's no way that they're all going to be in that book. And so you really do need to come up with like you can you can extrapolate and you can assume a lot of things, but sometimes you'll be surprised. And so it's just nice to have that evidence that you can pour over and have a kind of an academic approach to the animation. If you start off um, with animation in an academic way, uh, eventually the academia will then start to be kind of become instinct. And that's the kind of where it gets fun. You know, people are like, Oh, I don't like always having to use reference. It's like, well, it sounds like you don't feel like doing the homework. Is that, are you one of those people that like, don't, don't like doing homework? You eventually can stop doing homework when you, ma when you master understanding how things work. And then you can now just lean on your own brain and uh, your understanding of the patterns um, of what, how long it takes to do something and what kind of things happen. And once you do this enough and you start thinking about the mechanics and the forces and the physics that are involved, you will be able to figure things out. But the problem is you try to jump too far ahead and just do that without having that homework and that sort of the academic um, sort of exercise of breaking things down and really analyzing the craft out of something, then you're just winging it and stuff's always going to look like you're winging it. And you're going to have only yourself to blame why your animation is not, not improving. Then if I had a dollar every time someone was like frustrated with how their animation is not improving and they just, they're just doing the same thing over and over and over again and never actually ever really listening to advice. Like, have you thought about breaking down reference and being a bit more serious about using it? And a lot of those people are like, oh, you know, reference it's cheating. It's like, no, you're cheating yourself. Because reference is not not different, not any different than what artists do to learn how to paint or to draw. How do they start? They use still life. They look at they look at live reference and they try to recreate it. Observation 101. It's all the same, except we're operating in a different dimension, making it even more difficult because it's not just about pose, it's not just about composition, it's not just about staging, it's also about the movement. Those poses, you have to, it's what which poses are the most one, the most important ones to grab. That's that becomes an even a bigger dimension to the problem. But you gotta think about um, you know, it's it's the same thing. It's about look, learning from life around you, and then eventually you'll get so good at this and understand the rules involved in these actions that you're just gonna be able to just you just you can totally come up with it. You can pull it right out of your butt because you understand it. But most of you out there probably don't. And I'm looking at professionals. I'm looking at students. It's there's always something to learn, and that's why a lot of the pros are still still using reference because they will be surprised sometimes. They're like, oh man, that's yeah, I never thought of that. Of course, that makes sense. So that's what's happening. You know, and I want you to kind of get engaged intellectually with the reference and be like, ask yourself, like, why? Why does that like, why is that? And because when you ask yourself these questions, eventually, you will start coming up with real like you'll 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 see that that same question comes up all the time. And then it's going to unlock an understanding. It's like, oh, interesting. This is always happening when when these kind of things are happening this in this kind of an action. A good example of that is when you're shifting your weight from like one foot to the other. What are the things that should happen? There are some very predictable things that are going to happen. 
right? I think some of you can probably tell me right now what those things are. It's, but it's, but there's so many things um, that could be happening that are, that, that are cause and effect relationships. So, you know, allow yourself, you know, to be surprised every once in a while by, by really digging in deep and looking at some reference. Okay. So what are the poses that I'm going on and on about? What is this magic recipe? Well, there's actually not that many poses, to be honest. Um, there are some key ones, and they're interchangeable in many ways, which, you know, over time, we will we will absolutely get into um, over time, like how, how this can be used in different kind of scenarios. But tonight, we're going to keep it super simple. We're going to look at a very simple action like a jump because it's easy to break down. It follows the, the, the pattern so perfectly, so it doesn't require any, any kind of head scratching. It should be very, very, very straightforward. The first pose, okay, and I'm going to try to explain why every pose is a thing, okay? I'm going to try to talk as verbosely as possible so you can get inside my head. Obviously, the first pose, and before I get going here, the, the poses here are, um, you know, uh, it, this is, this is uh, assuming that it's just one complete action like a jump. And I'm going to be making some, some, some simplifications to this. Okay, there will be, um, I will be making some, um, some taking a little bit of artistic license here and there, just to kind of clean things up and kind of consolidate a little bit. Okay, like I will maybe look past some of these little things here and there, I'll try to explain it when it happens. But basically, every action, okay, assuming that you are starting from a point of not action, that you're idle in some way, like this kid just standing there, your first app pose has got to be where it starts. And that's your I call it the starting pose. It's where everything begins. And that could be the, who knows what that pose might be. be lots of different types of poses. I'm going to look for one that happened that's right before the next the movement to the next pose. Okay, so I'm going to call this the starting pose right here. Because as you can see, so if I start tapping on the, on the keyboard here, you can see that there's some movement that happens right here. So I'm just going to grab that pose right before that happens. Because naturally, if I wanted to animate this and have that kid standing there for a while, I would have to add a little bit of an idle animation to that kid and allow that to sort of live a little bit before I go and you know, um, you know, you know, if I if I want a hold of him standing there for a while, if that's part of the scene, um, then I would need to keep it alive. But for tonight's purposes, we're just gonna just really just slice surgically out the action itself and um, worry not so much about the um, the 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 uh, the stuff before and after. So this is my starting pose. I'm gonna hit the frame button. What the frame button does is it literally this is so freaking cool. It is it's it's capturing that frame, and I'll show you why that's useful pretty soon. One of the reasons it's useful is because I'm bookmarking that frame. So as I'm animating, I will be able to literally just jump from frame to frame of like I what this is. I'm doing like a scouting mission. I got my reference. It's right here. I can see the two views. I gotta look for my poses. So I'm going to find them. So that when I then bring, bring Maya up or whatever I'm using, I can then easily quickly refer to those right here by just jumping. I'm like, okay, what's my first pose? Starting pose. Okay, good. Let's recreate that pose. Understand it. Observe it. Recreate it. Next pose. Understand it. Observe it. Recreate it. That's pretty much the workflow. So right now, this is nice because it's very light. It's very super, super light. It doesn't stress me out at all. I don't have any 3D application open right now. It's just me and the reference, just going and doing my homework, looking at it, looking for those poses. Starting pose is my first pose. Um, and that, the reason for this pose, of course, you got to start somewhere, right? This is as simple as that. My next pose, as most of you are probably going to um, anticipate, is the anticipation. And, um, and you know, in the anticipation is uh, not always super obvious and in some cases isn't even really there. The the one important thing you need to think about with these, this anatomy and action uh, concept is you need to always remember that this is a template and you are charged with the duty of looking for these poses. I'm not saying they're always going to be there, but you but they probably are in most cases. And if they're not, there's a probably a justifiable reason as to why it doesn't exist. Okay. And, it, and that should be justifiable in your mind if you understand the purpose of each one of these poses, which brings me to a question. It brings me to a question, which is, has anyone ever asked themselves why, why is an anticipation even a thing? It's like people always regurgitate some sort of like overly simplified, well, it's because you got to go up before, down before you go up. Or it's like, but that's not really explaining physically why, which is proof to me that your brain is not thinking about it in terms of forces. I think it's going to be very useful for everybody from this point forward to think about all these poses as a necessary moment in time for a for, to, to, to illustrate or to, to, to show forces that are applied to a body of, of mass. Okay. I think it's going to be really helpful if we start talking in terms of force. I always think of the anticipation as 
the runway for an airplane to take off. If you think about it, what's happening is you need space and time to get your body moving at a certain speed to generate enough momentum to leave the ground. Because that's the goal, right? To jump up in the air means that you are able to push away from the ground fast enough to generate enough momentum that your body's own momentum from that speed will literally pick you up off the ground. It's kind of crazy when you think about it, but that's exactly what's happening, right? Spring would be the same thing, but in spring, you know, if you just pushed it a little bit and let go, it might just kind of go burp, burp, and then fall. It won't launch into the air. The reason is because you didn't give it an enough distance to push away from because the fur, the father for you squash that spring, the more tension it's under, but also the further, the distance it has. Cause you have to remember like anything movement takes time, right? It requires time for movement to occur. That's why you have slow in and slow out in animation is acceleration and decelerations are necessary things for a mass to start moving and to stop moving. It is 100% off. So the size of the anticipation is directly related to the size of the following motion. One million bazillion percent. That anticipation is the preparation for the action. Absolutely. But why? Well, the reason why is because, again, like if I, I wouldn't have to really anticipate very far if I just wanted a quick hop. Or it might just be like a little, a little. Now, if you want, if you're listening at home, which most of you are, why don't you all just do a quick little thing that I get all my students to do at this point. I get everyone to stand up. And I have everyone try to jump without bending their knees. Go ahead and do it. I'll give you a second. It's going to be fun. Don't hurt yourself. But if you try to do that, if you try to jump without bending your knees, what you're going to end up with is probably a pretty awkward looking jump that definitely won't travel very high. And the reason is that you're not using the biggest part, the biggest muscles that are big pushers to do it. You are going to travel a little bit, probably, depending on your anatomy. Um, you do have calf muscles, calf muscles. Okay, let's 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 pause this for a second. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the person for a second before we talk about the anatomy of an action. If you think about it, we are just a mechanism. The mechanisms are typically, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, if you boil down what the term mechanism means, it's it's a, essentially a piece of machinery that could be usually a bunch of pivot points, things that it can articulate, things that can push and pull, things that are able to move or move themselves or move other things, right? And if you think about it, the leg is a, is made up of how it, it, how many levers do you think are in a leg? How many levers? You know what a lever is? A lever is essentially like, um, you know, um, you know, a, a lever could be like typically requires one main pivot point. It's something that can like can can, you know, a lever would be something that that can rotate. Basically, there's some way of so if you got like, a, for instance, a seesaw, right, you have like a seesaw and um, you put two kids on that seesaw and they're the same weight, um, then it's going to just balance itself. Right. But what if we put a heavier kid on this one side, the, the you know, obviously the lighter side is going to go up. That's a mechanism. That's a lever. And it's where the word leverage comes from. Leverage comes from lever. And, uh, if, you know, in, in there's, a, there's a concept of using leverage and be able to, you know, maximize leverage comes down to the simple fact of how leverage works. So if you, another way to, to, to tip the scale, um, no pun intended here, in, um, I, this is where a drawing would be very helpful. I'll scribble right here because I can annotate on top of this. It's going to be a little ugly, but that's fine. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. So, because I, I think it's super important that we talk about this. I'm going to go and uh, do this. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So, um, you got like a lever like this, right? Yeah, we'll put a little a little triangle here and it's balancing. We got like two small children. It's going to be, there's going to be equilibrium, right? If I put a bigger child here, then obviously this side's going to go up, right? But another thing that you can do to maximize leverage, okay? And I think this is interesting. And these are the kind of things that you should be thinking about. Another way to do this is if I were to put the pivot point right here, for instance, um, if I were to if I were to create a, a, um, a, a scenario like this, um, 
you could push down on this side, okay, and which would cause this side to go up. But this would be very, very difficult. A lot of you are intuitively going to understand that if I push down on this side, that this side's going to go up, and you're going to end up like multiplying the force that you put into this will be greatly multiplied um, on this other side. This because the further away you are from the pivot point, the more powerful that force becomes. There's this interesting law, and I don't remember what the physical law is, but it is gigantic. And we've all experienced this before. It's the reason why, for instance, um, something like a shimmy or like a, you know, you, you put a, like a crowbar is based on the same concept. It's like you can, you can grab your fingers and try to pry something up, or you can put a crowbar and jam it in there. And the longer the crowbar, the more power you're going to have because it's further and further away from the pivot point. Because the pivot point is where essentially the contact point of where the claw that 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 crowbar connects with whatever you're trying to pry. So then I can put my whole weight on that one end of the crowbar, and it's going to split wood. It'll break stones. It'll. It's it, the longer I can make that, the further I can get away from that, the bigger and more powerful that is. Other examples of of of, of usage of leverage is all around us, by the way, are. Uh, um, wrenches. Wrenches are another form of leverage because it allows us to um, increase dramatically the amount of torque of turn power that you have the further my arm is away from the center point. OK, um, it, it's it's a big, long wrench and you get it at the very end and you push into it. We've all experienced this before. Imagine taking your hands, not just the fact that it's rigid and you can just push into it. It's also the leverage factor that allows you to turn a, a nut that's locked on something. You just can't budge it with your fingers, but then you get a wrench on it. Pop. It's no problem. So this leverage thing is important to understand mechanism, because when you take a look at the, the human body in the in the leg here, we actually have, what's your guess, by the way, I asked this question a little while ago, how many, how many levers, a lever being like pivot points, basically, do you see in a leg? In other words, what, how many actuating sort of motors are kind of in a, in a leg? The, 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 the hips are there because there are flexors that are in your hips that are going to, that move your, you know, that move your, your, your thigh around. So that is definitely part of it because that's what rotates your thigh. Then you have your knee that rotates your lower leg, right? These are the levers. And then you actually have another one, which is your ankle here, which rotates your, your foot, basically. And the ball of the foot is also another lever, which rotates your toes. So you got one, two, three, four levers all in a leg. That's a lot of levers. And they are all going to work in unison to push all of them. And muscles are designed in a way to actually actuate these levers. So if you think about it, if I erase all this business, um, if you think about it, the, um, there are, there are flexors. I can't remember the name of them. They're like hip flexors that are, um, that are, that are kind of that tie from like your, your spine, um, into your upper part of your leg. And that's, what's rotating your, your leg forward. And like, like you can all feel it yourself. If you, if you just, if you take a second and stand up and lift your leg straight forward and keep it straight, you will feel the tenons right here. Let me show you. Don't, don't mind me as I show you my crotch, um, right here. There's, there's these tenons right here. You'll feel it when you lift that leg. You'll feel it rise right here and become, I don't know if you can hear me that far away. This mic is pretty sensitive, but it really, really will start to, to, to flex. And then you'll feel the opposite if you actually try to rotate your leg behind you and it's your, actually, it's your, your butt muscles that are doing that, right? Your, your glute, glute, gluteus maximus or whatever. Those butt muscles are what pull your leg backwards and the other ones in the front are pulling your leg uh, in front of you. So the knee, the quadriceps, of course, are what's in, um, are, are, are kicking your knee forward, your lower leg forward, and your hamstrings are what pull your leg backwards. So we could talk about anatomy all day, but the point is, is that all the things that are there, all these muscles are designed to actuate. Most of this stuff is meant to be, um, you know, uh, other than the hips, the hips have um, uh, tendons on the side that can actually have your leg go outwards like this, away from the center. But um, in, a, in a jump, that's not super useful. It's really dealing with this one dimension of sort of like push and pull. Okay, so what we're doing here is our body in a jump, when we're anticipating what we're doing is we're moving our body down with these muscles as they all start to actuate. And now all of this mass, all of this business up here, all of this, a lot of the mass, the head's pretty heavy, but all of this mass is now lower. 
Okay. Then suddenly what we do, we decide that we're going to then use all those muscles to push up as quickly as possible. So the mass is now in movement. So if we, if we push all of those muscles, we use those to get, get all of that mass moving, um, there, we, we create something called momentum. And uh, there's this other concept called inertia. And basically, once that mass does start to move, and it takes time to get it moving, again, the more the mass, the longer it takes to get moving, the harder it, it is to move. Once it gets moving, uh, the bigger the mass, once it gets moving, the more difficult it is to stop. So for instance, like a train, a freight train, I always use this example about freight trains, we know how long it takes to get going. And we've also can observe how long it takes to stop. It's kind of epic. And it's because there's a lot of mass. It's a lot of mass, right? There's not a ton of mass on a teenager, so they're able to jump pretty easily. Um, so he pushes up, and the, the body's mass now has that movement on its own. But the goal is that just like an airplane, I need a certain amount of runway. The bigger the jet, by the way, I haven't even noticed this, but the bigger the payload, the longer the runway typically. Now that has a lot to do with also the size of the wings, the model of the plane, how fast it can accelerate, what kind of power the jet engines have. There's a lot of factors here, but basically at the end of the day, when you factor in all those things, weight, wingspan, so of the lift power, the maximum speed of the aircraft, all of these things will factor into, and it's all calculatable, and make no mistake, these are the things that are being calculated before takeoff, um, how much runway will you need? It is literally a, uh, a mathematical equation that you could actually figure out. How much runway will you need based on all of those factors? Um, it's the same thing for a jump. We just learned as, as children to figure out that, how much force we need in order to, be, to, to make something like that happen. Um, so basically, um, we just naturally know that the faster or the harder we can push, the faster we can be moving by the time we run out of, un out of runway. And then the next pose is the takeoff pose, what I call the takeoff pose. And, um, well, actually my generic term for this pose is actually the, the, um, my generic uh, term is my, is the contact pose. So let me explain contact pose for a second. In a jump, the contact in this case is a takeoff pose. The contact poses are really important in my, my, into my, in my, my little ethos here of anatomy of an action. The anticipation was important because it means any action requires some sort of anticipation um, or unless I, if, I, if I've already started in an anticipated pose, that's a good example why I would not need an anticipation pose. If, I was, if the character was already starting in a really kind of low pose, if they're already pre-anticipated, um, they don't need to participate again. They're like already there. And so they could start an anticipation pose and then just jump right out of it. Even though it looks better as a, in animation, if there's even still a little dip before the jump, even if I already, I'm, I'm already in an anticipated pose, but that will be pretty much a subjective thing for the animator to do. Sometimes we will embellish as animators. And even though it, theoretically it would work without a pose, it's still nicer to put it in. So people will, you know, will, will, uh, will add it. And there's a lot of reasons for this we'll get into later, but um, right now I'm going to try to just keep it simple. So we have, have an anticipation pose, which we understand is necessary for us to be able to position ourselves, give ourselves runway distance to push because the longer the distance, the faster I could theoretically get going because I'm able to push for longer, right? Um, just like, just like an airplane, you know, the, the, it keeps getting, it keeps getting building speed as it's traveling down that runway. And eventually it just lifts off because that's that there's a, there's a, there's a, breaking even point where where enough lift is generated from the wings and of course lift just in case you're wanting to nerd out for a second lift is created because the shape of the wing when striking air creates a high pressure under the wing and a low pressure of over it there's a reason there's a very specific shape to a wing and it cuts through the air flaps by the way are used when landing and it creates lift at the expense of speed it allows aircraft to land um, and even having the nose dipped a little bit so they the, the pilots can see the runway a little bit without actually dropping like a rock out of the sky. So flaps actually create kind of a cup feeling, which increases that, that sort of that coefficient um, the relationship of the high pressure, low, low pressure, and um, allowing them to kind of bend the rules of physics a little bit, just in case you're wondering what those flaps are. Don't confuse flaps with aerolons. They're completely different. Aerolons are what tip the aircraft like this, and the flaps are usually closer to the fuselage, and um, uh, you'll see them if, you, if you're lucky enough to live, uh, to, to live to sit by a, um, a, a window seat and you can see the, 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 the wing on landing. Look for it next time. You'll see it. Um, so... Basically, the anticipation was providing us that runway because we, we think of ourselves like an aircraft that want to be airborne. We're just not using lift. We're just going to be using momentum or thrust to get us up in the air uh, instead of lift. Uh, but uh, just two different forces. Aerolons, exactly. 
So next pose here is the takeoff pose, right? And the takeoff pose, otherwise known as a contact pose, um, is important because it's the last moment that we're on the ground during this push. It's extremely important. As a matter of fact, I still see animators that like forget this pose and it just looks like their characters float off the ground because without this, there was no thrust. The, you, you have to tell the computer to interpolate from an anticipated pose, which is a squashed pose, to a straight pose, which is the takeoff pose, and then we're going to be up in the air. Otherwise, we go from a squashed pose and just float squashed off the ground. This, this, this takeoff pose is super important. Now, I call them a contact pose because any time... Any time in action, this I like thinking generically here. Like I said, there is a generic term for all these poses, and then there's a specific term for um, for the for the uh, the action in question here. So a takeoff pose for a jump, but otherwise known as a contact pose, because a contact pose means that any time that my body or my mass changes relationships with other masses, that is a time that I need to put make sure I absolutely need to put a key down. I need to keep pose for all of those moments. Okay. So this comes in, this, this, you, you'll see this in lots of other examples, like punching someone would be any time that the moment that I contact you with my fist is a contact pose. So I better have that because it's a really important moment. It's a, it's a hallmark moment that absolutely needs to be recorded because it's an event. It's a meaningful event in the, mo in, in, in the story of an action. Okay. It means that something big is going to change. There is a, a, some, there's a cause and then there's going to be an effect. So here, this, this takeoff pose is a contact because it's the last moment that my, my feet are on the ground, okay? So it's always about a change in contact between masses. So it's leaving and receiving. So this is absolutely going to be my next frame. I'm gonna take that one. Um, and um, and it doesn't really require any other explanation, uh, uh, other explanation other than understanding that it's always important to show the last and first moments of contact changes. So then the next pose I'm going to be looking for is going to be what I call the action pose, which is the generic um, term again. The action pose can take many forms. I'm not going to get too much into it right now, but for all intents and purposes with a jump, the action pose is the uh, the pinnacle of the jump. It's I've achieved my objective. I got up to the top of my jump. And then obviously the consequence will follow. So um, let's just grab something that looks like around the top of the jump. So we'll grab that frame right there. It's hard because the camera's panning. So it's hard to know exactly which frame it is, but I think that's probably a pretty good ballpark. So I'm gonna grab that pose too. So now we have the action pose, okay? So action pose um, is, you know, generically, it's all about trying to, um, it's all about trying to make sure that you've 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 captured the action in its true essence. So I would say that like the action of a punch, we talked about punch a little while ago. Um, the anticipation, the starting pose would be like this. The anticipation pose would be like this. The action pose would be my fist flying through the air, probably really close to the moment that I contact whatever I'm trying to strike. That would be the contact. And then we're about to see the next pose. Um, Oh, so there's actually, there's no takeoff pose in a case, in a case like that. So I, I skipped that if you didn't notice, because there is, there's no, there's a no takeoff, but there's going to be a contact. So there's an action and then the next contact, which is right here. In this case, the contact, I call this the landing pose. Okay. And, um, always be careful. You can easily get tricked with, um, with reference because like the legs are a little bit more bent than they probably would be. This is probably like a microsecond after the contact with the ground. So I often make the, the legs a little straighter, uh, maybe a little closer to what you see here. Cause the legs would be typically reaching towards the ground, but you could, it's, you know, like I don't really believe that that's the very first moment of contact, but you know, as long as you understand what it is, you can always capture this and then kind of purify it um, based on your understanding of what its job is as a pose. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to grab that pose too. So we got our landing pose, otherwise known as a, a form of contact poses, because we are now changing our relationship yet again with another mass. The mass in this case being, of course, the, the, the environment, right? The ground, the box, and now the floor. And now my next pose is going to be what I call um, the reaction pose. Um, and that, that is essentially the consequence. The consequence of the action, it's the follow through. It's the squash in this case. It's the compression. Because just like we need runways to take off, 
we need runways to land. It would be pretty weird if we didn't run land on a runway. Can you imagine? That would be pretty pretty. That, that we, it's, it's otherwise known as crashing, and uh, it, it doesn't usually end up um, turning out very well for the people inside the plane. So we actually need to always remember we need that landing pad. We need some space to slow down, and that's what this is. What you're getting is the contact is the moment of contact in the ground. The plane touches down, and then this is the runway to to uh, to 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 um, to stop. Basically, our legs are now doing the same thing they were doing on the takeoff, but instead they're using it to slow us down. We're using the same engine in our leg, pushing away from the ground, but we're not trying to leave the ground. We're trying to slow ourselves from going into the ground. Basically, we are we would like it so that our, our face doesn't make contact with the ground. So our leg is constantly pushing away. And um while you'll see people that do really big jumps, you'll see those parkour artists all the time. There's a correlation between the amount of anticipation and the the how much you need uh, to to take off, and how high you want to jump. For instance, it's the same thing for landing. So if you're just landing from like a little hop, you don't need to bend your legs like this. But if you're jumping from like a two story building and you want to land, then you're probably going to like give yourself more runway because it takes it, it puts more less pressure on your skeleton and on your on your on your body um, if you give yourself m more time to slow down. Basically, um, so just always think of it in these terms. I like this runway analogy because it's an easy thing to remember. It allows you to sort of align with really what's going on and every. Everyone can intuitively understand the concept of a runway, even if you haven't really thought about it. And hopefully I've triggered your brains, at least some of you, to like actually consider that now. It's like, well, yeah, I never, I never thought about why there's a runway. Why? why? I mean, you know, there are airplanes that, or aircraft that can take off without a runway, helicopters for one, um, and um, vertical take like VTOLs, um, vertical takeoff uh, and landing uh, um planes like a hawker harrier for instance these are designed specifically to be able to take off without uh, either a limited runway or no runway at all uh, helicopters obviously just need a pad um, and the cool thing about that is it's all about the diff it's all about physics again they have a way a different mechanism they don't use lift to well helicopters do but they actually what's interesting is they you their 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 wings on a helicopter are the rotor but instead of you know, pushing their wings into the air like this, they use torque to spin the wings. It's basically, it's a fan. If you ever like get in front of a fan, you get air blown on you. If you're on the back side of a fan, you'll see that things are being pulled. If you have a powerful enough fan and you are holding it, you would literally get pulled by the fan because it's, um, you know, any action has, you know, equal action in return. Um, and that's just the way it works. So it's still using lift um, in, 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 a, in a way, but it's just that, that, li that instead of, you know, um, it's like propellers on a plane um, that pull a plane forward, right? As opposed to a jet engine, they just mounted those propellers vertically. So that now instead of just going forward, you're actually being pulled up. Um, Hawker Harriers and other VTOLs, they are, they actually redirect the thrust so you can actually go upwards on, on, on a takeoff. Anyways, look into it if you're curious. So we can nerd out about, nerd out about this all night. Um, but but uh, basically, in general, we need some sort of runway. And, and I think, you know, there's still runway necessary for, for helicopters. It needs to generate enough speed. Helicopters can't take off until the rotor gets to, up to a certain speed. And then it's allowed to take off. Uh, same thing for um, um, VTOLs. They need enough thrust, and it takes time to build up that thrust. It's not instantaneous. Yeah. So we got a landing pose. And now what we're going to do is um, we got to get into this low pose here, which is the ending of the runway. So we're just going to look for like the lowest ish pose. I'm usually looking at the hips. If you haven't noticed, it's the hips are usually because it's the center of mass. Um, so it's usually the best guide as to where when are we low or high. You know, um, it, it's 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 a good guide to choose because it, it's it's really the mass that we're talking about here in something a ballistic action like a jump it's all about measuring um this mass fl moving around space so it's kind of it's kind of interesting to think of it like that um and use the using the uh, the hips as a, the average point of that mass okay so i'm going to grab that as my as my um my reaction pose which is the squash in this case the the squash on the landing and then finally, what we're going to have is another pose. What's happening here, I'm going to, I'm going to grab a couple poses in here um, because this, this kid actually stops. He, the, the action completes here. He doesn't go into a landing because it's, because it's such a deep landing. Um, he, he just sort of lets the action re, re, sort of settle, and then he then gets up at the end.
And that's important to note. This get up at the end is actually a separate action because there's a pause between it. You kind of end the action when you dissipate the energy. As soon as the energy is halted and kind of it, it stays in the same place for at least six frames, basically the action's over. Now, this is an important point because I see a lot of people try to chain actions together. And what happens is they suck all the energy out of the momentum on the first action and then they kind of pause it. But then they actually then start another action without starting with another anticipation. Parkour artists, a perfect example. When you take a look at parkour um, um, athletes, you'll notice that they're always keeping the momentum flowing. If they're jumping from like, say, like pole to pole to pole, you see parkour artists sort of jump from the top of these small landing zones. It's important the momentum just keeps going. They will just they'll just redirect it and they can they can sort of daisy chain these actions and these actual compression points these these reaction poses end up being the anticipation to the next to the next launch because if you notice there's a co there's a, there's a comparison to my anticipation pose and my squash pose they kind of look very similar the squash pose is obviously obviously deeper but if we were to go go back and look for there we go that right it's it's squashed like this just like this this one's deeper but they're still squash poses i could use this would be difficult because he squashed a bit too far that would make it difficult for the muscles to then be able to launch again but if he didn't dip so deep he'd be able to just squash in and then immediately redirect and launch again but if he if you choose not to do that if you decide to stop you now, once that action's over, it's over. You need to restart one from the beginning and have an anticipation, a proper one, and then a takeoff. You can't, you can't just wait and then have a delayed launch. Um, so that's what's happening here. He's literally landing, and you can see that energy come to a rest. See? He bounces, and then he kind of stops, and then he gets up. So we're going to call, call that the end. But there, to, to end this action, there's always what I call a recovery and typically also a settle. What those are is usually because these are kind of follow through actions the, the the usually the body goes a little deeper or further than it naturally wants to be and so what the body's going to do is it's either going to push um um like uh either either intentionally or just unintentionally just because of like the limits of the human body gonna push back into more of a natural pose like a spring right if you let go of a spring it wants to go back to its normal shape same thing for a body really if you push it into extremes and off, often it's also like um like a like a, a um, an intentional thing it's like i don't want to be all the way down there i want to be a little bit like less squashed so what you're seeing here at the bottom is you're seeing this here as our bottom pose but then notice how the hip comes back up again you see that it's natural it's overly compressed and then the body's elastic sort of uh, form wants to come back into a slightly less compressed uh, sort of state which is what this is i call that the recovery so recovery from the actual squash so i'm going to grab that one and because it was such a violent landing because it was a pretty big one then you'll probably also fall find this see this the weight, the, the waist came back down. I call that a settle. It's you're not always going to see a settle. If you were, if it was a very controlled motion, and it it wasn't um, super violent, and it was like uh, you were landing really quietly, and everything was really controlled, and everyone, every, everything you keep like there wasn't a, there wasn't any looseness to it, then you could just go into a recovery basically. It's like a compression and a recovery. And that recovery might even be very slight. The settle is usually like, because what's happening in the settle, just to make this clear, is that the, 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 the body's desire to kind of, re, um, kind of recover into a more, um, a more uh, comfortable state or pose, there is, like I, like I said, an elasticity to it, like a spring. And so what happens is that momentum, that, that pressure to go back out and reinflate into a more comfortable pose has its own momentum. And so what happens is we then typically overshoot that recovery pose and then gravity is always going to have the last word and it's going to bring us back down. There's usually at the end of an action, you usually find a settle always, almost always, um, depending on the severity of the action. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Because if you, if you think about this, that recovery and settle is a, almost in, its, in itself its own separate action. I'm trying to push back out, but I don't push hard enough. I'm going to launch. I'm going to just kind of settle back down. And I find that settle animations are one of my biggest pet peeves in video games because animators are often not putting them in. I, interestingly, because they're usually told by designers not to have them in because they're not um, at the right level. Maybe they don't understand. Maybe, I don't know. I, maybe they don't have a very experienced technical team. But you could always interrupt those settles uh, is usually what I want. I want my animations. I always tell my animators to put the full settle in. Let that action come to a rest. 
and um, and just make sure that we don't stick a player and force them to watch that settle all the way to the end. Make it so that I can interrupt it and push forward once it makes sense that my, my character would have the ability to move forward again after an action has completed. After I've properly recovered from the landing, for instance, would be a good time for me to then be able to have control over the stick again and have the character move forward. But it, uh, leaving it out is going to make your, your, your animation look very weightless. Having that settle really says this character is heavy, there's heaviness to it, and that gravity, always remembering about gravity, always being this persistent thing is going to help make um, your animations feel a lot better. So there you have it. You have all the poses you've got. Let's go through them all really quick. We got a starting pose. Okay, one. We have an anticipation pose, two. We have a takeoff pose, three. We have a action pose, four. We have a landing pose, five. We have a reaction pose, six. We have a recovery pose, seven. And then I forgot to put a marker on my, my, my settle. I will put it right there. Okay, eight, eight poses in total. That's what we need. Okay, and if I hit play now, which is with this play button up here in, in Rhino House, it will play those poses and only those poses. Check this out. And interestingly, when you watch this, it works. You can understand that action. That action is going to work because it's all there. All of the important bits are there. Is it like fully and fully complete enough to call it done? No, but it's your block. That is, you literally have everything you absolutely need for that action to make sense. Um, anything other than that will be like holds that you would put in, breakdowns you'll be putting in, then eventually overlapping action and other things that need to be in there to make it feel you know, good. But right now, that is your foundation. You could build a house on this. You can build a full animation on these poses because there's nothing missing as far as shaping the most important events in an action. This is what it's all about. What are those most important things that I cannot live without? You're looking at them right now. Anything that any, you, 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 you not put one of those poses in there and it's just not going to work. It not, well, not, not as well as it should. It's going to, there's going to be something really broken about it. So the fun thing about this is, is I've now got my poses. I've got eight of them. I've got timing. All I need to do all I need to do to get good at this now and to get good at animating is get good at understanding those poses and be able to like extrapolate and like recreate those. The timing is already there. Now I just have to be able to understand and observe the differences between those poses. And part of that, may, it, it's easier to do that when you understand the mechanisms that are involved. Like I've been trying to explain like why these things are happening because there's certain things you'd be looking for, right? But I think that the key here in my mind is that this like if you want to get good at animating all you need to do is have a formula like this and then just produce every week take a new action start simple like a like a something like a jump like this or a sidestep or something you could just record yourself doing it most of us have probably two cameras in our life now either it's my phone and my friend's phone or my daughter's phone or my my dad's phone or whoever it might be that I may have access to another f camera source for like 15 minutes. You can set them up, invest in a little, um, a little, little mini tripod and a little phone mount. Usually they're like a little clip thing, but um, you know, invest in some, some, some small gear that allows you to very easily set up a couple cameras perpendicular for one another and test this theory. I'm going to draw it. I'm going to come to it. I think it's a perfect time to stop tonight because I have essentially explained the theory. What I'll do on the next stream, we will do is I'm going to start showing you. I'm going to open up Motion Builder. I'll take a piece of data like a jump from Mixamo, a free source. Not everyone's going to have access to Motion Builder, and I understand that. So it's not really about Motion Builder. It's just about you. You could also take Mixamo. Um, you could do everything I'm going to show you in Motion Builder actually in Maya as well. So if you have access to Maya, which I think most of you probably do, or even Blender, and Anything that will take in a skeletal sort of animation source as an FBX, you're going to be good to go. Um, it'll be done a bit differently. It's a little slicker in Motion Builder what you can do, but don't let that trouble you. Um, it, it, you I'll, I'll explain what what you would have to do um, differently in a um, in uh, in my or I don't know Blender well enough yet, so you'll probably have to figure out your own workflow there. But I think you'll be able to figure it out based on you know, what I do. Um, so that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to use motion because what I can do is it's the next obvious step because it's like, you know, what if I had the ability to precisely 
capture every one of these poses now that I know which ones I want. Well, that sounds a lot like motion builder because motion or a uh, motion capture because motion capture, instead of it being 2D representations of an action, you actually have three dimensional representation of an action. So I can just need, I just need to find the poses. And so if I find those poses and then do what I'm doing now and just play only those, po those poses back and then hit play, um, what we should th see theoretically is an action that works and it might surprise the complete garbage uh, and mystify some of you just how well that will work. And I, what I, why I like showing that is it because it gives hope to people that find animating difficult because it is difficult, especially if you don't have the right sort of perspective on the problem. And all this is, is understanding these natural moments that a body needs to, to kind of produce in order to propel themselves through space. And don't make no mistake, walking and running is, is, is a ballistic action just like this. It's just a repeating one. And I'd like this, this, this whole thing of me doing these live things to, to keep going and I'll extend out the um, once once we get through complete one jump, then we could talk about other use cases and just sort of apply this over and over again to different um, to different situations, because I think that that will help everybody understand how to apply this. And what's going to happen, I think, is people are just going to like if the worst case is that you're just going to have a completely new perspective on how to look at motion so that you know what kind of poses are, are going to be important. You may not completely you might not completely revolutionize what it what how you how you approach animation um, completely. But it, I think it's going to give you some a different set of goggles to wear when you're looking at the problem. Okay, so thanks for hanging out. It was fun. I think that this is uh, going to be a very, very interesting series that I'm going to be giving. I'm literally giving you um, uh, a kind of a behind-the-scenes look at what my years of animating um, boils into. What does it boil down into? Is It boils down to this. I apply this all of the time. This is basically how I start everything. Because even if it's an acting shot, you are going to be thinking about moving the body around acting is action so if you know it's just it's acting is just the motivational part of the movement so obviously expression and these other things need to fall, fall into you know and posture and like the the body language comes into it um it's adding a bunch, a bunch of subtext but it's still movement and so you still need to understand body mechanics in order to do it so uh, we will get into acting stuff eventually as well and how how this formula and this concept how it falls into um into uh that big picture basically. But I think what I'll probably end up doing is trying to make like a proper learning path eventually. But I could put this out there for now if people want to watch, you know, sit, sit, sit down and take the time to watch through this stuff. It just it's a little bit drawn out and not as condensed to make it really accessible. So um, we'll figure it out as we go. This is all just one big experiment. It continues to be and thank you for being part of the experiment. Thank you for being part of the community. It's always a pleasure to hang out with everybody here. The next class is going to be looking at motion builder and looking at three dimensional data. So I can essentially prove to you my, my concept because whether I'm getting these poses from a digital source already, or whether I have to take the time to meticulously recreate those poses in 3d from 2d images, it doesn't matter how I get there. poses or poses, right? When you think about it, there's nothing magical about motion uh, motion capture. It's just that it it's just a three dimensional capture of emotion, as opposed to two dimensional ones that are not you know and don't don't exist in 3D in any way. Although some great technology advances are happening right now on you know creating motion capture data from 2D images. I don't know if you've seen some of these pretty pretty awesome and they're evolving like every day. Um, with some machine learning to, to, to sort of fill the gap uh, where you can get motion capture data from like literally just one single camera, which blows my mind, to be honest, but it's happening. We, here we are. Here we are. This, is, this is where we're at as a human species. So, um, it does, so it doesn't matter how you get it. We just need poses from something. And uh, so I, by looking at it, by looking at motion capture data, I can show you just capturing only these poses, looking at what that, looking at what that, what that does. And once I've proven that point, then the next class will probably be, okay, let's do it from, from scratch then. Let's actually take the time to animate it. We'll choose a rig and we'll just apply this by looking at the reference. And uh, maybe we'll probably use the same reference that we started with here. So I have like a one-to-one -one, and the goal will be to try to recreate what I have in front of me. That would be the goal. Now, what I'll normally do as well is I won't just do it verbatim. I usually add a little bit of my animator mind as to like, okay, but like I want to make that a little faster and I want to make this a bit bigger. I will usually apply a bunch of exaggeration to it as we always should as animators. Because you have to think of like, I'll leave you with one other thought. If some of you rush off and try this, by the way, which I highly encourage you to do, because if you come back to the next stream, you will have a little bit of experience. And some of those light bulbs will already start going on and it might make the next classes even be more meaningful. So consider this as homework. Take, take the time. It doesn't take very long to just literally look at an action, record yourself, 
Follow along with me if you want. Go record yourself, do a simple action, but keep it simple, like a jump. You don't even need to jump off a box. Just jump forward, try not to fall and um, record yourself doing that from two different camera angles you can follow along. But like, look at it and see that these poses are in fact going to be there. Um, and um, eventually we'll come back to this reference and we will animate a character doing this and apply a bunch of exaggerations and fun to it. But but remember, as an animator, we're not trying to reproduce the cam uh, a camera. We're trying to animate. So we are going to provide a bigger than life sort of treatment to this, make it bigger, heavier, more fun, more dynamic. And a lot of that has to do about purifying lines of action. It has to do with exaggerating the speed of things, ex exaggerating the weight of things. It's about trying to add, and I'll try to, sh I'll try to, I'm not going to go too far with that because it's going to muddy the waters a little bit, but I will be doing a little bit of that because just naturally that's how I roll. Giving a little bit more hang time on the jump is just, it's going to make it look better. And so I'll just naturally will do it. And then eventually we can get into like, what would you do if you wanted to then stylize this? Okay, well then we'll talk about playing with the timing, playing with the poses a little bit bit more and sort of maybe looking at a reference animation um as a as a style guide and then be like okay well how would we make this look more like warner brothers you know what would we do and then it would be a matter of looking at the sort of choices that warner brother animators make to make their animation look like warner brother animation it's not that difficult but you 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 need in my mind you always have to apply that as a layer on top that's the icing on the cake this is the cake what we just talked about tonight is the cake everything Everything depends on this. If you don't understand this, you will not be able to animate very well because this lives at the core. What you decide to do and how you manipulate this and how you how you exaggerate and like play with this and bend the rules of this, that will send us in different directions on different stylistic final looks. But you got to think of that look dev as this layer of treatment on top of the fundamental mechanics that live under every action. Okay? Cheers, everybody. Have a good one. Stay animated or else. Bye.